Praise the Lord. Okay. The first step to a life filled with God is to believe. Book of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse, I'm going to do verse 6 and then verse 3. Hebrews 11. But while we're getting there, Lord, we're in your house. We desperately need to hear from you. I need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. And we pray that you would come and meet with us and talk to our hearts today as we open your word and we open our hearts and as we get ready for the next day to dawn and for the next footstep to be made, we pray for the leading of God. And we thank you that you've promised to give us that leading, Lord. And take us into your word now and reveal yourself to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 6 of Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Then I'll go back up to verse, verse um, 3 later. But by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. You think about that? Things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. Uh, today we have electron microscopes, we have models of atoms, we have nuclear engineers, nanophysicists. And we know for a fact now that everything that we can see around us is made of things which are not visible. Um, we... <laughs> Everything that we call matter is made up of atoms. Everything we can touch or stand on or drink or throw or drive or live in is made up of atoms. And yet, did you know that 99.9999% of an atom is empty space. Perhaps you don't believe me, so go ahead and ask Google the question. Hey Google, what percentage of an atom is empty space? And it'll give you the number. So if that is true about atoms, that they're mainly empty space, then how could they be what constitutes iron and brick and lemonade. How is that possible? I am not able to explain that to you. And yet it's true. And if you and I believe that the info around atomic and molecular structure is true, then we can go ahead and make use of iron and brick and lemonade. But there are many things that we don't understand, and yet they are real and functioning parts of our lives. I don't understand 5G or what's the older one, 4G LTE um, technology, but I still use my phone. And if I call you, I believe that the person that I hear on the other end is you. Of course, for all I know, it's an actor or a robot or an artificial intelligence put in place by the phone company. Could it be? But I believe is you. So can we have faith when we don't fully understand? Hebrews 13.3 tells us actually that there is an understanding 
that is enabled by faith. Right? I'm asking, can you have faith if you don't understand? But Hebrews is saying, yeah, but understanding is enabled by faith. It is by faith that we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. It's by faith that we understand that the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. It is by faith that we declare the soundness, the reliability, the actually the inexplicable accuracy of the word of God. Why do I say that? Because the inexplicable accuracy. Because Hebrews 11.3 was written a very long time before it could be proven to be true. People had to just believe it or not. And we have that choice. And the purpose of the message today is for each of us, for you, for me, to be able to say with full voice and full heart, I believe. I believe. Believing is initiated by the Spirit of God. Many of us can remember those first few times, those first times when we were sort of aware of God as a child and felt so drawn into his presence. Anybody remember just becoming aware of God? And just that, that sense of being drawn into his presence. Now, believing, believing depends on a willingness and openness on our part. To come to God, we have to believe that he is and that he wants to be known and experienced and that he rewards those who diligently Seek him. So go back to our openness. How important is our openness, our willingness? It's, it's foundational. Being open and willing to believe, it, it's a necessary condition of the mind without which it's impossible to approach any kind of dealing with God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, must believe, not just in God's existence, but in his, pos in his positive intent toward us and toward anyone who will seek him. And now that second piece, right, believing in God's positive intent toward you personally is, is crucial. Without that, you're dealing with a potentially malevolent being who might not be acting in your best interest. It's powerful, but maybe not trustworthy. Someone about whom you might need to retain some doubts and suspicions. If you choose to believe in the book of Genesis, then let's take a look there. Take a trip back to the garden. Because in Genesis 3, here's this scene. The serpent is talking, a serpent is talking with Eve, uh, one of the first humans. And we're going to read verse, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, hath God indeed said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Let me tell you something. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise. So she took up the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, who was far away, and she ran and told him all about it. What, what did it say? She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Notice, the serpent did not come with an attack on the existence of God. Right? Serpent didn't say, God, there's no God. Serpent did not attack the existence of God. Nor was it an attack on the wisdom of God or the power of God. It was an attack on the character of God. The, this proposed new narrative, this insinuation, was that God wants what's best for God, not what's best for you. God wants to keep you down and prevent you from being like him. Meanwhile, the exact opposite it was and is true. God wants to lift us up. God, God would love for us to be like him. We're his children. We're created, in fact, to be living expressions of his being. So, of course, he wants us to be like him. Ever had somebody tell uh, an untrue story about you? Okay, so what hurt more? The fact that the person told the story or the fact that people who are supposed to know you believe them? Okay, tell me A or B. A is the fact that they told the story on you. B is the fact that people that know you believe them. W which is worse, A or B? Right? So, Satan's attempt, actually his accomplishment, was to have those two people doubt the character of God who they knew. They were walking with him, talking with him every day. So people are supposed to know, are believing something about somebody who they're supposed to know. From somebody they just met now. Talking with a forked tongue. Anyway. His success there was to have these two people doubt the character of God and not believe that what God did and said was for their best. So they bit the bait and they ate. They felt that they could serve, by doing so, they could serve their own interests better than God would. That's what their actions said that they believed, that I can serve my interests better than God can. Isn't that why we sin, period? I think I'm going to get more from sinning than not sinning, so I go ahead and sin. I can serve my own interests better than God can. Which means I'm smarter than he is, I'm more capable than he is. Anyway, have we ever believed that? Maybe we haven't gone through the whole thought pattern, but then our actions say that. Um, okay. An American penny, what's, there are some, if, if you look at an American one cent, there are some words in Latin, um, and there are some words in English. I think the Latin words are e pluribus unum. What, what are the words in English? In God we trust. What does trust mean? In God we Trust, but give me the cash. <laughs> Actually, I saw, I was on Eglinton, and I saw a sign in a store. It said, in God we trust. Everybody else must pay. <laughs> anyway, what does trust mean? Stephen M. R. Covey, he's the son of the more famous Stephen Covey, who wrote, 
Seven Habits. Anyway, Stephen the Sun, Stephen M. R. Covey, wrote a book also. This one's entitled The Speed of Trust. And one of his key points in the book is that business moves at the speed of trust. Um, where there is trust, things can happen quickly. With trust, a lot of things can happen that simply can't happen in the absence of trust. Without trust, there is every kind of roadblock and caution and lawyers and additional costs and reasons for delay. And, and so this author, Stephen M. R. Covey, he, he described trust as having two elements. Um, competence and intent. So, okay, got that? Two elements of trust? I don't hear you. Competence and intent. So what does that mean? Okay, imagine you've just been diagnosed with a brain tumor. But good news. Is there good news with a brain tumor? Anyway, but good news. It's operable. Right? It's terrible when you have a brain tumor and they tell you it's not operable. So good news, it's operable. So that's good news, but there's still one nagging little realization. All right? The question of whether you will live or die or end up with no control over your bodily functions will all be in the hands of one person a brain surgeon to whom you were briefly introduced. So you ask the hospital staff, is he good? They say, all the time. You can trust him. He's never failed us yet. <laughs> Meanwhile, you hear this doctor's name being paged repeatedly over the PA system, and the staff assures you, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. So as you're preparing to go in under the drill and the saw and the knife, you keep asking yourself the question, do I trust this surgeon? And so this is where these two elements of trust from the, from the book come into place. What were they? Competence and intent. So let's start with competence. Do I believe that this surgeon has the ability, the competence, to cut through my skull, find exactly what needs to be removed, remove it safely without taking out or damaging anything else? and put my head back together in a way that works. So that's competence. Can he do it? What about intent? This surgeon is equipped with a drill and a saw and a whole connection of knives and needles and drugs and complete authority in the operating room. Can I be sure about his or her intent? Now, what if you had noticed, remember you just had a brief introduction, just, hi, this is Dr. Sloan, blah, 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 blah. But during that brief introduction, that, you're like, that surgeon's face reminds me of someone. I, have I, have, do, do I, it reminded you, so, and just before the anesthetic takes hold, right, and, and you go under, you remember, that is the face of the kid that you played the meanest prank on in high school. A very mean prank. The kind that could scar a person deeply. Now, once your head is open in his or her hands, what might their intent be? But well, we're not dealing with a surgeon 
today. We're dealing with God. Can you trust God? What do you feel about God's competence? What do you feel about God's intent? Romans 4.3 says, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, Abraham did a lot of things in his life. But the thing that the scripture is most concerned about is that Abraham believed God. And this was an important enough fact that God would use that to account to him for righteousness. Well, did Abraham always tell the truth? Um, did, but God said, you know what? The thing about you that is significant, Abraham believed God. And that was accounted to him for righteousness. Can you say honestly, truly for you? Yep, that could be said of me. I believe God. Back in Hebrews 11, we're, we're going to verses 8, 8 to 10 now. We see that Abraham didn't just passively believe, oh, I believe God. He believed actively, right? When he felt that God had called him, he got up and went. Uh, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would afterwards receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing whither... <laughs> Sorry. It, I'm, I'm reading it New King James, but it's in my head in King James. You know, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, went out. Anyway, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why did, why did he do that? Why did they do that? For he, for he waited. Oh, okay, I'm going to have to do it out of my head. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker. If you keep reading Hebrews chapter 11, you'll encounter something in verse 13 that could stop a person in their tracks. You're reading about all these heroes of faith. They did this, they did this, and then you hit this verse, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them Far off. But, but guess what? If you keep reading that verse, it, it turns. Even seeing the promises afar off was enough for them to confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Okay, verse 16. Why would they do that? Why would that far away promise that I might not even get to enjoy in this life at least, I, I, it is big enough for me to believe that and to reach out for that to the point where I'm going to say, listen, I don't even care. I am a stranger. And, oh, let me tell you about Minneapolis. I have spent way too much time in airports, period. Minneapolis airport is a city unto itself. And if you ever get, go there, you, you'll see what I mean. Make sure you have a couple hours layover so you can just walk around. You're, it's like, how, what is this? It's an entire... So, anyway... I heard that there's a few airports around the U.S. that they built that way, that in case they were ever attacked from either coast, they could have a complete military operation from the middle of the country. Apparently, Minneapolis is one of those, but it could be a conspiracy. I don't know. But if you're ever in Minneapolis airport, it's big. There's food there. There's stuff to buy there. There's like a shopping mall in there. there there's everything in there. However, 
if you're traveling and you're in Minneapolis airport and it's massive and it's a city unto itself with stuff to buy and stuff to eat and places to sleep, you want to stay there? You're going to confess that I'm a stranger and pilgrim. As nice as it is, I'm just passing through. Right? You might have a nicer seat in the waiting room than I do, but we're both just waiting for our flight. We got somewhere to go. Verse 16, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. I had never thought of that before. Some people, when their name gets associated with God, God is like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. Other people, it says God is not ashamed to be called. God is, I'm his God. Yep, I'm her God. God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. We prefer that everything that we pray about, everything we believe God for, to be resolved today or tomorrow. At the latest next week, at the very latest, within our, at least within our lifetime. Yet this chapter of Hebrews is telling us it might not be so. Our belief in God might not be proven out while we're still on this earth. I'm not saying while we're still alive. We'll still be alive, just not on this earth. But it might not be proven out while you're walking this dirt. Are we okay with that? Can we still say, I believe? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. The Apostle Paul said, folks, if in this life only we had hope. Okay, now I, I got to do this. I, I know New King James says pit pitiable, but I got to do it in Old King James. We are of most, of all men most. Okay, ask yourself, at the times that you are feeling miserable, is it because you've pinned too much on this life? And it's not going the way you'd like it to go. So then, indeed, we are, of all men, most miserable. Or to be pitied, because we're not even seeing reality. If we're going to believe God, and if we're going to believe in what God is doing, then we can't limit the scope of our belief to a year or a lifetime or a locality. But very often we are very much bounded by what we see, what we feel right now, and what we happen to know or what we think the applicable limits and time frames are or should be. But none of that defines what God is doing or will do. We don't define that. We are, we are not actually asked to understand. Only to believe. Now I'm looking for uh, people of a certain age. I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand I don't ever need to ask the reason why why cause I know he'll make a way through the night and through the day so I don't need to understand I just need to hold his hand. All right, there you go. <laughs> so we're not actually asked to understand, just to believe. In fact, we probably, in many cases, don't have the capacity to understand, given that God's ways, by definition, are higher than our ways, and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. So... 
when I can't explain because I truly don't understand, it's no big deal. I don't need to understand. Some things you should, but many things, just hold his hand. According to the Gospel of John, chapter 11, Jesus finally arrived in Bethany four days after his good friend Lazarus had died. Now, he, Jesus had been advised quite a while before that that the man was sick. And the two sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, they're good friends of Jesus, and they had sent for him. And you would expect, if you send for your good friend who is able to heal people, and you tell him that his friend is sick, then what's he going to do? He's going to come, like, right away. And he didn't. And now, after the fact, here he came. So, as soon as Jesus showed up, Martha met him with a blunt statement. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, if anybody here, a human, I was told to come to earth to meet some. Are there any here? Uh, humans. If you're a human, a piece of Martha most likely lives in you. In fact, most definitely lives in you, but you can read about that. <laughs> a piece of every human alive actually lives in you. Anyway, you and I wonder why things happen that we don't want to happen, right? And why would God let it happen? Why, if there, if there is a God, and if he is looking, and if he cares, then why would this happen? I'm related to Martha too, just like you. And to those questions, I, I wish I knew. But the next thing Jesus said to Martha was, your brother will rise again. Martha said, yeah, 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 I like, got the last day, whenever. Uh, so Jesus tried to make it plain in verse 25. He said, no, I here, right, I am the resurrection and the life. Right here, right now, today, I, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You won't actually die. And Martha's like, but look what Jesus the next thing he said was not a statement. It was a question. He looked at her and said, do you believe this? Everything you hear in church, all the messages you hear, what, the point is, do you believe this? And for each of us, this is, this is a key question that life keeps bringing us to. Do you believe this? absolutely important because the question is important because of what your belief enables right mark 16 16 jesus said he who believes and is baptized will be it gets simple but you can get baptized and just get wet because you didn't believe. He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 17 this goes on to describe the supernatural power that will characterize the lives of those who believe. Verse 20, let us know that they did believe. Again, not passively, but actively. They went out and carried the message everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming their words with signs following. God will confirm this word with signs following in your life if you go ahead and believe. Okay, let's start to conclude now with Romans 10, reading from verse 8. 
Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That, sorry, I, I just don't want to go too fast over that. Did, did you hear that? Did you read that? This word of truth, where is it? It's very near you, he says. In fact, it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Because God is not ashamed to be called your God. So, believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Can we do that? Are you ready to do that? Is there somebody here who believes in their heart that this universe was framed by the word of God? Would you stand up and say, I believe! Anybody? Okay, 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 go. Sit back down. Okay. Is there somebody here who believes that the promise of Abraham applies in your life? That everywhere you put your foot, God is stepping with you. Would you say, I believe? Is there anybody here who believes that Jesus Christ has come? God manifested and incarnate in human flesh. Would you say, I believe? Do you believe that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended up into heaven, that he stands every day as our high priest, as our advocate, as your protector, as your provider, as your healer, as your hope beyond this world. Would you say, I believe? Do you believe that he walks with you and talks with you and fills your heart with his spirit? Would you say, I believe? I believe. Do you believe that when you don't know how to pray, he prays through you with groanings and words that cannot even be uttered? Do you believe that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds would you say, I believe? Today, right now, let God do a spiritual work in you. Let God activate His Word down deep inside you through an operation of His Spirit. Quick, powerful, sharp, unshakable. I believe. <sighs> Sometimes your life might feel like a rerun of the book of Job. You're trying to do everything right, but everything wrong is happening. You're suffering, or your family members are suffering, and you can't understand why. You're trying to find God in all of it, but it's hard. Job said, I looked to the right, I couldn't find God. I looked to the left, he wasn't there. He has not come when I wanted him. He has not been right on time. Anybody? And yet I know that my Redeemer liveth. And even if disaster or sickness or sadness 
or as Job said, or worms destroy this body, I believe that in my flesh shall I see God. I believe. I believe. The Apostle Paul said, I was not a good person. I've caused a lot of harm, he said, but, but I believe that God loves me. Romans 8.38, he said, I believe, I am persuaded that nothing can separate me from that love, not death, not life, not layoffs, not people who are being completely unreasonable. Okay, I'll go back to the scripture. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is expressed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I believe. I believe that in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, that loved us. Can you say, I believe. Mm. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Demonstrate with your life. Live it strong. Live it on into glory from beginning to never ending. I believe. I believe, therefore, have I spoken. God bless you. We're going to, if, if you're able, we're going to stand together and do our benediction. But we're so glad that you were able to join us this morning. If you're online, it's our hope that you were able to have a real encounter with Jesus during this service and that you have been blessed by the worship, the Word of God. We pray that you have a blessed week. And God willing, we look forward to seeing you in person seeing you in the big virtual world next Sunday. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.